I hope you uh, are as touched as I am by that video. I've seen it in its raw footage. We actually hired uh, a Ukrainian film crew to get some footage for us of those men as they're moving in and send it to us. And I saw the footage and I've heard the stories and, and every time I see it, I get emotional about that. Uh, Elise, I said this last week and I hope you were here to hear it. She's a hero of our faith. A hero that nobody writes about. She's not in the papers. It's not in the news. But God's doing amazing things. And she's just one little aspect of what God's doing around the world. We hear so much bad news in the world today. It's good, isn't it? Just to get a little glimpse of what God is doing all over uh, in and through people like Elise West. And so you're part of that as well. Your generosity and your prayer really does matter and really does make a difference in the lives of those men in that place. And we can't wait to tell you the story. Uh, the more stories as that unfolds and we'll get closer to see what God does through that. So let's bow now and ask God to speak to us through his word. Lord God, we thank you that you're present and real in places like the Ukraine and, in, and right here in our own hearts. And we desperately need to hear from you, so we're asking you to speak to us through your word. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week I asked you the question uh, that everybody asks this time of year, are you ready for Christmas? And all the children cheered and all the parents groaned, right? So I'll ask you again, are you ready? Are you more ready this week than last week? Yeah, all right, okay, all right, okay, better, it's better, better. Well, let's use this time we have this morning to get ready in the way that really matters, in our hearts, to prepare ourselves. We sing joy to the world, right? And there's that phrase in the song, let every heart prepare him room. So let's use the time we have this morning to prepare where it matters most, for what matters most. Uh, by coming to his word. We've been working our way through the prologue of John's gospel, John chapter 1, the first 14 verses, kind of like this overarching prologue telling us who Jesus is and why he came into the world. We've been looking at different aspects of these remarkable 14 verses. Let's follow along as I read again those 14 verses for you as we prepare our hearts. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world. And the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John lays it out for us why Jesus came into the world. Later, Jesus in chapter 18 will say, for this reason I came into the world, for this reason I was born, to testify to the truth. Everyone who believes the truth listens to my voice. So let's listen to Jesus this morning, shall we? Let's listen to the truth and what he has to say to us. We began this series looking at Jesus as the light of the world, the word made flesh, the light that shines in the darkness and what that means for us and to us. Pastor Brian talked to us about that. And last week then we looked at this, this man who was not the light, who came to bear witness about the light, John the Baptist and his unique role and how we also are called to bear witness to the light. But this morning I want to look at just four verses that tell us what it means to become children of the light. You heard them. Let's look at them again, verses 10 through 13. Verse 10, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Right here, John gives us the reason why Jesus came in the world, so that we might have new life new birth, be born again. How many of you have ever heard the phrase born again? If your hand's not up, you're not listening to me, right? We've all heard the phrase, right? Born again. What does it mean to be born again? We sing it. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. He come to raise the sons of earth, comes to give them second birth. We sing about it, but what does it mean? And can we be honest for a minute? There's a lot of baggage with the term born again, isn't there? People have, there's a lot of misunderstanding about this phrase. 
It's not necessarily in our culture a phrase that's used uh, as a compliment. Some would say so they're, they're, they're that born again person. In fact, my wife and I, we were driving to um, Iowa to watch our daughter play basketball. And while we're on the road, she was knitting and listening to uh, one of her books on tape. And, and I, we both saw at the same time this bumper sticker that looked just like this. It said, born okay the first time. And I saw it and I had to do like a, it took me a minute. Wait, oh, I know what they're saying. I'm fine. I don't need to be born again. My birth the first time was just fine, thank you. And she tapped me and said, did you see that? I said, yeah, I did see that. And when you're preparing a sermon, you're always thinking about it, even if you're not working on it. And so I just thought about this passage immediately. And then we stopped for gas and for coffee, two of the life's necessities. And we, there was a coffee shop attached to the gas station. And when we were walking out of the coffee shop, my wife, she's so observant, it's so smart. She said, look at that. She points to a bulletin board on the way out. And on the bulletin board were all of these notices and ads, if you will, about these groups to help you with your problems in life. One of them said, join the moon circle, which meets the first Thursday of every new moon or whatever, I don't know. And it was like, and it literally said to help you escape from the problems of life. So, so you have this bumper sticker that says, born okay the first time. And then you've got this wall full of postings saying, we're not okay, we need a little help. That's kind of the human condition, isn't it? I'm fine, thank you very much. But actually, I'm not. I need help. And the Bible's answer is, you're not okay and just need a little help. You need to be born again. You need a new life. This is what John's saying in verse 5 when he says, darkness, lights come into the world, but the darkness has not understood it. Light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not comprehended it or understood it. And in verse 10, he came to his own, but his own did not know him, did not receive him. His own people, verse 11, did not receive him. And then verse 12, but to all who did receive him, he gave the right to become children of God. What I want to say is that the new birth is a necessity for all people. I think some people use the phrase born again as if it's a type of Christian. I've heard people say that phrase, like those born again types. And what they often mean by that is overly emotional. They're very zealous, overly morally self-righteous. Those born again types. And it's, it's kind of a pejorative term in our culture, isn't it? What the, the text of John is saying is that this is not a type of Christian. This is definitionally what it means to be a Christ follower. You must be born again. It's not an emotional type or a morally self-righteous type. It's what it means to follow Jesus. And nowhere in Scripture is this idea fleshed out more specifically than in an encounter Jesus has with a man named Nicodemus. And it happens in John chapter 3, just a couple chapters later. Nicodemus is a, a Pharisee, a ruler of the people, and he comes to Jesus at night. So I like to call this story Nick at Night. <laughs> I know. I think it's funny too. All right. Let me read this in verses 1 through 5 of John chapter 3. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night... And said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, no, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, Nicodemus is about as morally upstanding and religious a guy as you're going to find. He was a member of the ruling council, the Sanhedrin. He was a religious and social leader in Jerusalem, respected by his peers. He was a Pharisee. That means he was very serious about keeping the law of God, about being morally good and religious. He's respected, moral, religious, upstanding, upper-class individual. He's a good guy by every standard of human measurement. And he comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, we know you're from God. Nobody could do what you do if they weren't from God. And Jesus doesn't say, well, thank you, Nick. I've heard great things about you too. Which is the polite thing to do. What does he say? He says, I'm telling you, you can't even have this conversation with me unless you're born again. And Nicodemus doesn't get this at all. What are you talking about? I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm a grown man. How am I going to be born again? Unless you're born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. Actually, if you think about it, what he's saying is offensive. He's saying to this religious man, this morally upstanding guy, he's saying, everything you've, your whole life counts for nothing. 
You have to start over. You must be born again. Counts for nothing. What do you mean counts for nothing? Look at all that I've done. Look at how hard I've tried. Look at all that I've, I've been very religious. This is what it means when Jesus, when John says, born not of a husband's will, not of human will or the flesh or of blood, but born of God. Meaning, it does not matter how good your family is, how long you've been in church, how, how well you've done in life, nor does it matter how messed up your family is, how much you've failed, and how broken you feel. No matter how good you are, you must be born again. No matter how bad you are, you can be born again. You see what he's saying? It's a necessity for all of us. Some of you come in here feeling pretty good about yourself. I got news for you. It counts for nothing. You must be born again. Some of us come in here feeling pretty broken, pretty hopeless. I got news for you. You can be born again. The new birth is a necessity for everybody. That's, that's what he's driving at here. Now, the second thing the passage tells us about being born again is that new birth means something happens to you. A radical new life and a radical new identity. New, me, new birth means a radical new life and new identity. The new life is not always dramatic, but it's always definite. You're either born or you're not. And what are the signs of, of new life, new birth? in you. Growth. Living things grow, right? Moms and dads, what do you do when your kids are little? You celebrate every little sign of growth, right? Every ounce gained, every half an inch on the wall when you measure them, everything they do. I once knew a family that sent a picture of baby's first solid poop to the grandparents (laughs) on Facebook. That's an issue. We should talk about that. That's a different sermon, right? Like, we're so excited about any sign of growth. Gaining weight, talking, walking, rolling over, sitting up, doing all this stuff. Why? It's signs of development. It's signs of growth. Spiritually, what are those signs? What are the signs that you're growing? How do you know? Nobody's born fully grown or fully developed. First, a growing love for God and for others. A growing hunger for his word a growing sensitivity to the Spirit of God in you, sensing that God is nudging you to say something to someone or to be generous in this way and responding to that and knowing this didn't come from me. I didn't used to think like this. A growing desire to obey God and to leave sin behind. Doesn't mean you're perfect. Doesn't mean you don't screw up. What it means is I have a growing desire that I want to obey God and not the world or my own life. A growing awareness that he loves you and that being a sense of security in your life. These are signs of growth. Dallas Willard wrote a book called The Divine Conspiracy About Spiritual Growth, and he says, and I love this line, one of the surest signs of spiritual growth is the thoughts that no longer occur to you. Do you hear what he's saying? This used to be my issue and my hang-up. I used to have a struggle with this, and I don't think like that anymore. Look at that. I'm changing. Something's happening to me. I'm growing. I'm not the same as I used to be. Do you see that in your life? I talked with a man a few years ago. He's 55 years old. He's new to our church, but he's been around church, church is, all his life. He made an appointment to see me, and he said, Pastor, something's happening to me. I said, what? He said, I, I don't know exactly, but like I've been reading the Bible all my life, and I'm reading things I've read hundreds of times before, and I'm seeing it in a whole new way. And he said, and he was a very conservative guy. I mean, uh, way right. His, his views were kind of to the right of Mussolini. Like he was a very conservative, right-leaning guy. And he really had no uh, time for anybody who didn't share his political bent and leanings. He said, even though I totally disagree with them, I don't see them as the problem anymore. I actually care about them. He said, I, said, I don't understand. Like I, I'm, I'm 55 years old. And I'm seeing things differently. I was like, I, he's like, what's happening? I'm like, surprise, Pinocchio. You're becoming a real boy. Right? <laughs> Literally, that's what's happening. The intellectual things he believed that he called his faith were no longer just in his head. They were penetrating into his life. New birth, signs of growth. 55 years old, been in the church all his life, and he's now waking up, becoming new, born again. And he's not making it happen, it's happening to him. 
Let me read to you an excerpt from, um, can you guess? There's a reason Lewis says things better than most people. C.S. Lewis, in his great book, Mere Christianity, uh, there's a chapter at the end of the book, uh, toward the end, called Nice People or New Men. Did Jesus come to make you nice or to make you new? Listen to what Lewis says. And now we begin to see what it is the New Testament is always talking about. It talks about Christians being born again. It talks about them putting on Christ, or about, about Christ being formed in us. Put right out of your head the idea that these are only fancy ways of saying that Christians are to read what Christ said and try hard to carry it out, as a man may read what Plato or Mark said and try to carry it out. It means something much, much more than that. It means that a real person, Christ, here and now, in the very room where you are saying your prayers, is doing things to you and in you. It is not a question of a good man who died 2,000 years ago. It is a living man, still as much a man as you and still as much God as he was when he created the whole world, really coming and interfering with your very self, killing the old natural self in you and replacing it with the kind of life he has. At first, only for moments, then for longer periods. Finally, turning you permanently into a different sort of thing altogether. A new little Christ, a being which in its own small way has the same kind of life as God, which shares in his power, joy, knowledge, and glory for all eternity. Jesus didn't come to make you nice. Nicodemus was already nice, but to make you new. I mean, I hear people say things like, well, she got religion, or he got religion. Nicodemus had as much religion as you're going to get. And Jesus says, you got to start over. You need a whole new life. You must be born again. That's what he's after. That's what's happening. Now, new birth means a new identity, not just new life. This is captured in the phrase, become children of God. Did you catch that? The right to become children. Now, some of you might object. Wait a second. Wait, wait, wait. Time out. Aren't all people God's children? I mean, are we all made in his image? Don't, aren't we all children of God? Yes, Paul does say in Acts 17 that we're all his offspring. In the sense that God is creator of all, we're all made in his image, and we are all, therefore, his children to a degree. But John says something very specific. He says, to those who believed and received, received him and believed in his name, he gave the right to become children, rights they did not previously possess. Something different is happening here. This is a different kind of belonging in the family that he's talking about this identity. And I want to talk about your identity with two words. I feel like we're playing, pick, uh, you know, what is the, what's the, you know, charades. Two words. First word, sounds like, right? <laughs> intimacy. Your new identity is characterized by intimacy. When he says, he gave the right to become children of God, that's adoption language. Some of you I know have adopted children. You know what this means. New rights, new status, new privileges that you did not have before you came into this family, and now you have. A new relationship, a new access to your father, a new intimacy. I remember I read a biography of the life of Abraham Lincoln about his family life a couple of years ago. And it, it, one of the, it told a bunch of stories about the interactions of his family in and around the White House. Lincoln was famous for, for being a bit of uh, kind of letting his children run wild in the White House, particularly his youngest son, Tad. Uh, there's stories even during the Civil War when Lincoln's in meetings with his war council in the Oval Office and Tad Lincoln running in with his toy sword, interrupting the meeting, and the president just letting him do it. Can you imagine if, if you tried to run into the White House today? Just run across the lawn, run right up? You'd, you'd get shot on the lawn, probably. But what if that's your father in there? And he loves you and you're his precious daughter or son. Well, you have different access. Come on in. It's my boy. It's my girl. You have, what, what we're being told here is he gave you the right to become children. Now God is not just your creator, whether you acknowledge it or not. He's your intimate father. You have access to him. You can come right in. The book of Hebrews tells us that we have, he has opened a way for us, a new and living way, and we have confidence to enter the holy place, the presence of God. Why? Through the blood of Jesus who gives us access and intimacy with the Father. We read in Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17, this profound statement about what we have in terms of our access and our, and our rights as children. He says in verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, 
heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. If we're children, then we're heirs. What does it mean to be an heir? It means you have an inheritance. You have rights and privileges and status and an inheritance. That's the second word. Intimacy, the second word, inheritance. The New Testament is jammed full of references to our inheritance in Christ. We don't talk about this much, but it's full of references to what we have in Jesus. We've been given these rights and privileges, new relational status. You know, I think, I, I make fun of Hallmark movies a lot, and for good reason, they're ridiculous. But, but in fairness, I remember watching one with my wife, and I can't remember, they all have hilarious titles, like A King for Christmas or A Kingdom King, kingdom for Christmas. And there was this one where there's this guy, and he's kind of an everyman guy uh, living in America. And he finds out that he's actually the heir, he's actually uh, the, the rightful heir to the throne of some fake country called Monravia or something, I don't know. Uh, and, he, and he goes there, and he finds out that this is this whole palace, this kingdom belongs to him now. And he, he doesn't really, he's kind of a good old boy, he doesn't really like it, he's not sure he can adjust to it, but it's his, it's his inheritance. You know, every orphan's fantasy, right? Well, my real dad. See, I got mixed up at birth. My real dad, he's a wealthy. He's a king. He's a ruler. And someday he's going to figure out what went wrong and come, come get me. And then I'll belong to him. That's not, the Bible's saying that's not a fantasy. Those, those stories are pointing to a longing in the human heart to be fully known, fully loved by the God who made you. That's the message. That's what it means to be born again, to say, I have a new identity. It's not a fantasy. The king of kings is my father. And all of his rights and power and glory comes to me. I don't deserve it. I didn't accomplish it. But he gives it because that's who he is. And you know, what, you know what identity really is? Identity is two things. Your sense of significance and your sense of security. That's what makes you, that's where your identity is. So just ask yourself the question, where do I feel most significant? Where do I feel like I'm, I matter? This is what makes my life matter. And where do I feel most secure? Whatever the answer is, that's your real identity. And the gospel message is, there's only one place where that's secure. Listen to what Peter says, and there's lots of places, as I said, but the, Peter puts this beautifully in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, about our inheritance and what's coming to us and our rights as children. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. Do we have it? First Peter 1. I've got it here in my Bible. <laughs> First Peter 1, chapter 3. First Peter 1, verse 3. Okay. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Think about that. He's caused you to be born again, and he's got an inheritance sealed for you. The message here is that wherever you find your security and anything else or significance, if it's in your career, some of you know this, painfully you know this, it can be taken from you. You can lose it. Is it in your marriage? Some of you know this, painfully, it can be taken, it can end. In your family, it can crumble. In your own self, and your accomplishment, that can fail. And many of us know the pain of these different failures and losses. The message of the gospel is there's only one place where your true identity will be kept for you. You don't keep it. He keeps it. It's secure. It's in Christ. It's in him. This is what it means to be born again, to say I, I, something has happened in my life that I'm now... I have a new life that I didn't have before, and I have a new identity, intimacy with the Father and access to him, inheritance and rights, and, I, and I'm secure in that, even if everything around me crumbles. These two realities come together in your heart. To be born again means you have an identity that is 100% secure. Okay, okay, you might say, but how does this happen? How, this is the question Nicodemus asks, right? How do you get born again if you're already born? Can you go back in the womb? That doesn't make any sense, Jesus. It's a very literal guy. New birth happens by receiving and believing. New birth happens by receiving and believing. There's a lot contained in these two words. Uh, John 1.12, let me just read it again for you. He makes it very clear. 
Jesus says, not everyone receives, but to all who do receive and believe in his name. There's the two words. He gives the right to become children of God. Receive him and believe in his name. What does it mean to receive Jesus? That's kind of a strange phrase, really. How do you receive him? Well, the word literally means to welcome in, to welcome him in. Well, how do you welcome Jesus in? I'm going to just read some statements to you, and I want you to evaluate your own heart. Are you welcoming him in this way? He comes to you as Savior. Welcome his salvation. He comes to you as leader. Welcome his leadership. He comes to you as authority. So welcome his authority. He comes to you as provider. Welcome his provision. He comes to you as a healer. Welcome his healing. He comes to you as a judge. Welcome his judgment in your life. He comes to you as king. Welcome his rule and his reign. All of it. We sing, joy to the world, the Lord has come, let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. The mistake we make is that we can pick and choose from that list, right? I welcome you, Jesus, as my healer and my savior and my provider. Yes, I would like that. I'm not so sure about judgment and authority and leadership, however. To be born again means to receive him for who he is, all of him, all of who he is. It's a package deal. I often use the phrase of smorgasbord spirituality, right, or buffet Christianity. Mercy, grace, love, acceptance, yes, please, I'll have seconds. Oh, judgment, self-sacrifice, no thank you, I'm full, right? It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. Welcome to receive him, to all who received him, him as he is, who he claims to be. You don't get to pick and choose. And he wants to be all those things to you and more. Receiving Jesus means welcoming into your life with all of who he is. So it's not a peaceful coexistence with a God, sweet baby Jesus in the manger, who makes no claims over you and asks nothing of you. That's the sentimental Christianity of, of our culture. And it's no Christianity at all. It's just a couple times a year at Christmas and Easter, we remember, oh yeah, isn't that nice? It's nostalgic. I like that feeling. But it's, doesn't, it's not new life. It's not new birth. And second, believing in his name, which is really another way of saying receiving him. What does it mean to believe in his name? I'll tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't just mean believing he existed. Neither does it mean just believing that the incarnation or the resurrection are historical realities, although that's part of it. It means believing in who he says he is for you, for me, my Savior, my King, my Lord, my Forgiver, my Provider. And it means to stop believing in all the other names that are trying to claim rightful, wrongful lordship over your life. Listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 5, verses 43 to 44, speaking to the Pharisees who question his authority to make his claims. He says, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? He's being crystal clear, isn't he? Believing and receiving are the same thing. And you only find him in one, in Jesus. And you cannot receive him or believe in him if you're placing your trust in all these other things. This is placing your trust, your life in his hands. Now here's the beautiful part about John 1. Ultimately, if this happens to you, and I know for some, many of you it has, and it's happened for me. Doesn't mean my life is perfect. Doesn't mean I'm holier than people. But I know what's happened in my heart. I know what's happening to me still. And some of you know the same thing. When you, when you get that, you realize, I didn't do this. Think about the analogy. Born again. Remember how proud you were of yourself on the day of your birth? I made it. Look what I've done. <laughs> no. You, you babies contribute nothing to their birth. They didn't plan it. They didn't make it happen. They come about, we come into this world by the will and the suffering of someone else, don't we? 
That's precisely the image God is giving us. Your new life in Christ comes about by the will and the suffering of someone else. In John 16, verse 21, Jesus says something very profound. He says, a mother in childbirth is in pain because her hour has come. But once the baby's born, she forgets her anguish because of the joy of the new life. Do you see what he's saying? If you look in your life and you say, you know, I, got, I still have a lot of growing to do, but I know that I've been forgiven. I know that I belong to him. I know that I have a new identity, new access, new inheritance, a life I did not have before. You realize, I didn't make that happen. I didn't account. That's happening to me by the will and loving suffering of another. This is what it means to be born again. It's not a type of Christian. It's what it means to belong to him. And here's the tragedy. I, I see this all the time. You can be in church for years and not have this, and not experience this. That's a tra- I, I, I pray for the word sometimes, because I, 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 fa- I fail at this. Some of you right now have been around Christianity and religious stuff all your life, but you've not been born again. The new life of Jesus hasn't flowed into your heart. You don't have that sense of security and identity and belonging that he longs to give to you. You believe he exists, you know stuff about him, but you're not new. You're not growing with a life that is not your own. And he longs to give it to you. And some of you here have been, but you drift, right, like me, become stagnant. What better moment, what better time for you to experience new life in Christ than the season when we celebrate his own birth for you to be born again. So I'm going to invite you to pray with me. I'm going to pray a prayer, especially for those of you, maybe you're identifying your own condition. You're saying, you know, I think that's me. Would you pray with me? Father God, you are the eternal word made flesh, and you came into our world for one purpose, that we might become your children by being born again. And you've made it so clear, we complicate it, but you made it so clear by receiving and welcoming you into our lives and placing our trust in who you are. And so for anyone here this morning who you're stirring even now, God, give them the grace and faith to welcome you in and believe in your name, Lord Jesus, that you alone can forgive their sin that you alone can lead their life now and for all eternity, that you alone can give them the belonging and the acceptance that they long for. Help them. Bless them. Make them new. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.